guest joining us on today's special 14-year Big Blend Radio Champagne Sunday show is an award-winning actor, a voice artist, and author, Melanie Chardoff. You've seen her on Broadway. You've seen her off-Broadway. You've seen her as a character that she created on the show Fridays, which now I've really just got to sit and binge watch. Like, if I can get that somewhere, I need to just binge watch it. I got stuck on her YouTube channel this morning, and that's it. Like, I'm home forever. Um, you know, Larry David, you know, some of the, you know, the people I look up to in life. Uh, Seinfeld, hence the music bringing her on. Newhart and Rugrats. Her memoir is coming out on February 2nd, 2021. Nancy and I both have been reading this, and I'm telling you, this is hysterical and it's candid. There's, it's just she's a great writer, she really and she tells be. life lessons in the most um, humorous way that we can swallow these life lessons. Uh, it's called Odd Woman Out: Exposure in Essays and Stories. So it'll be out in paperback, ebook, and audiobook that she did the voiceover for, right? She oh, narrated yes. it. And cool. uh, February second is the date. Uh, through Books Fluent, we love them. And uh, you can pre-order it now, so you can get on Amazon, but you can also go to Melanie's website at MelanieChardoff.com. But Melanie, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you, everybody. I, it seems like there's like a major crowd there with the dogs and the women and Steve, and <laughs> I feel like I'm at a big morning party. It's like, hoorah, yeah. great way to start my day. Well, listen, it shouldn't be boring. Listen, that's the thing. You know, this is <laughs> happiness. We need to have a party and have a good time, but... I mean, you've done so much. It is like your resume of just all the shows you've been on, on the theater productions, uh, you know, the movies, um, and then the work that you do, too, because it looks like you're also teaching people things and getting into the life lessons with people, which is part of your, your memoir as well. Well, I actually teach charisma utilizing improvisation. And um, I do it with people all over the world. I, I've worked with two people in Japan. I'm currently working with two women in Australia who are trying to melt the glass ceiling in the agricultural industry, mm -hmm. uh, which is a patriarchal organization mm -hmm. for generations. And they're trying to melt the glass ceilings inside themselves first uh, mm -hmm. that are in cahoots with the men so that they can go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, not be afraid to hold their ground, get angry, be strong. So um, I have them enact scenarios. We play roles, and then they borrow the charisma from the characters in these scenarios. Um, the characters are generally more outgoing than these introverted women. So uh, it becomes a real kind of acting scenario that becomes applied to life, and they are all prosperous and aggressing and taking on larger roles in their corporations. So that's what I'm currently doing. Well, I'm waiting for my little book to come out. Well, talk to you That's on that. Wonderful. I love yeah, that. I, I love, love that. Because part of acting and um, doing skits and everything is you get to be somebody else for this amount of time. And I know that as a singer, when when I was doing that, you know, I started emulate because I do. I can like I, they call me Parrot Kasuku for a reason when we lived in Kenya because I can copy and then I would never shut up as you can hear. But it is about. <laughs> um, Taking in, learn, you learn by emulating someone, and then you find your own wing. So that's kind of, is that the same thing with what you're doing? Yeah, well, I, I give them famous women speeches like Temple Grandin, Brene Brown, Hillary mm. Clinton, to prepare and enact. Uh, not because they're doing an imitation of either of those people, but because those people are very out, outspoken and articulate. And so I get them to match up their, their inner lives with the feelings in those speeches, and it really helps them discover courage, aggression, uh, entitlement, all kinds of qualities that they have not felt qualified to flex. Hmm. So um, they're more ballsy, or shall I say over-easy, as a result. You get it? Women yeah, have I ovaries, do. not balls. Yeah. I don't jump because I was about to say something. I've already <laughs> talked about, you know, okay, I'll, I'll get, I'm trying to behave. It doesn't work. But <laughs> you're also teaching them to talk. And because it, isn't it like the whole thing is, oh, pretend the audience is naked. I can't do that because I really do see, you know, all the little things. I, I'd be too curious the about their bodies. I'd be too I know. curious. I want to exactly. look at their private parts. So that would exactly. work for me. <laughs> Things like that. You would just walk down off the stage and say, hey, excuse me, but what is that right there hanging there? <laughs> what, what what I tell that? people to um, talk to the audience it's, as if it's one intimate person uh, with a lot of eyes, just one mm. big face. But, of mm. course, when you're on a Zoom or a, uh, a virtual uh, 
you know, transmission. It's a whole other game. You have to set the lens and the lights specifically. You have to know how to work the camera, which is above generally the heads or to the side of the heads of the people on the screen. There's a lot of little adjustments you have to make, not only uh, to, you know, transmit your message, but also to receive, to look into the eyes of the people on the screen and be intuitive about what they're feeling about you. Mm. I think somebody should invent Zoom makeup. Yeah, I think that the um, there's airbrush makeup, you know, for high def television, and that seems to work pretty well for me. Oh, I also, need that. Also, Zoom, Zoom has a filter feature, so you can actually take out some of the imperfections just by pushing some buttons. Right. Oh, yeah. well, Nancy, you need to try this. I know. Yeah. yeah. Why haven't you pushed buttons? Yes, you I have to push to. little arrows. You, you really do. I oh. know, and maybe maybe I can get some for the hair. No, I'm kidding. I'm just saying. Yeah. Like, I, I, need, I, I need your to hair take out stray hair. It does take out stray hairs, though. It, it does it take it out the big chin? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? I know. Hey, you know, but I, I'm curious also, going from, you know, being a woman in the era of, of TV and, you know, like Saturday Night Live, we've done some shows on that. And, and also think that there was a comedian that wrote a book on Larry David and um, just, and I think was talking about Fridays. And I think that's actually one of the first places I heard about you it was years ago. And he um, was just talking about like how, and we had a lady uh, who was in, SNL, but because she was black, wasn't getting anywhere, and they kept mm. like making her go get tea and coffee, and she was like, oh. I want to, uh, yeah, it was, and it was interesting about because I'm going, there's women there, are they getting paid as much? Are they being oh, treated never. equally as men, like in Fridays and things like that? We because uh, we all we got favored nations, things. we all got the same salary. Wow. Okay. Wow. Wow. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, and then. Well, hmm. listen, Fridays, I this whole thing, Andy Kaufman, I didn't know that Michael Richardson was in there with you, too. Like, uh, this whole thing, I just, I I love it. I love Fridays. I mean, how well, much fun it, was it, it to do? It was harrowing, and it was hilarious. Uh, the, the talent on that show, we were all iconoclasts. We all had our own brand of comedy. So when we had our first meeting, having come from all different fields, uh, of comedy, you know, there's so many different branches. Uh, they wanted an AB, ABC wanted a clone of Saturday Night Live, mm-hmm. and we were humiliated by this because we all had our own ideas. But I was going to be the Jane Curtin, and we were going to do uh, recurring characters like the Bees. And so our first episode, our first sketch, since everyone is, was anticipating our cloning Saturday Night Live, we took it on, and we all were dressed like bees. And um, we did the little uh, Gilda Radner characters, and so we just completely imitated them, and that way we wormed our way into the affections of the critics by self-satirizing. And I think we did a lot of self-satirizing on the show, which Mm. um, was our difference, you know, maybe our difference at the beginning. I don't think Saturday Night Live was as into self-satirizing actors at the beginning as our show Mm. was. Well, But it was a heavy load to try to compete, you know, and for a while... They were in a nader, and we were in our zenith, and we were mistaken for Saturday Night Live because people didn't know what night it was in a lot of cases. And a lot of people thought I actually was on Saturday Night Live those years. And after the show, uh, Fridays, we all left Fridays, I was invited to be on Saturday Night Live. But I was so exhausted by that format, which was six days a week, seven days of writing, constant stress and rehearsal. Um, and a lot of drug addicts in the mix, not myself necessarily, oh. but other people. Uh, mm. So the pace was set higher than normal, normal, higher than caffeinated, shall we say. Mm. Uh, it was a very speedy kind of work format. And there was a lot of like big energy men like Michael Richards uh, on the show, and he tended to be heard more than the women <laughs> who were more demure. So, mm. um, you know, there was a lot of stress. So when the Saturday Night Live offer came in, I really just wanted to be in theater for a while and escape into another reality than live television. Um, so that's what mm-hmm. I chose to do. But, of course, Saturday Night Live has gone on and on and on and on and on. And it's been in like a – it's part of our culture. It's iconic. Mm. Yeah. But you got to also share the stage with Andy Kaufman. That would kind of be weird. Like he – I don't know. He's, he's, a, he's kind of a freaky – 
He's being, I mean, well, from us <laughs> not knowing him and seeing and, you know, watching, you know, the movie and all of that, like, we don't know him. But what was that like? I mean, you've got Michael Richardson. Well, I knew Andy years people. before that because we were both working at the Improv Club in New York. And I was there for okay. the early tryouts of his Mighty Mouse performance, <laughs> which was oh, like oh. perform performance art. And his audacity was what fascinated all of us. The nerve to go up there and just be silent listening to the music for 20 seconds. Nobody had ever done anything quite like that. So he was, to me, a nice Jewish boy. When we first came out to L.A., he used to, uh, you know, sit at the track at Fairfax High School here in Los Angeles and watch me run the track so I wouldn't get mugged at night after, you know, after work hours. Um, And we would go for macrobiotic food, and he talked to me about transcendental meditation. So he was like a regular guy, but he was very addicted to audience attention, even negative attention, making noise, getting attention. So our our show's, uh, you know, improvisation of that piece was like a stunt. And I have to say we get better ratings for that particular evening of television than for any of the triumphant stuff that I thought we did artistically. Uh, Oh, I see yeah, Isn't but that that's odd, though. Uh, yeah, it was odd, that's, and odd was yeah. what he did. You know, he was mm-hmm. very kind of. It was never quite like hilarious breakout after the Mighty Mouse era. It became mm-hmm. kind of like, should we laugh or should we scream? It was kind of different. Mm-hmm. But off camera mm-hmm. and out of his conceptual art, he was really a, a, a lovely person. Quiet, seemingly introverted, much more introverted than uh, his characters, like that wow. Tony character. Tony, what was mm-hmm. his name? I forgot. Anyway, he was a lounge singer, a Las Vegas guy. And he played that character so charismatically that you wouldn't have believed it was the same person because Andy was basically, at least in the early days, very introverted. Wow. Wow. It's interesting. And then being with all these different people, that has got to be emotionally exhausting, having all those, like you're saying, then there's drugs in the mix. I know from the music world, that's got to be, you know, just – you're carrying everybody's energies. So when you go to the theater, is it different because your energy shifts to ex- just that moment of that play and then having the energy of the audience? Well, generally when you're in a play, you're not writing it together. We were writing the show together, which you know forced us into a room all the time. Mostly the guys got their stuff on, but we all contributed. Um, so, yeah, it was a, it was a crowd. It was um, – we didn't have a leader like Lorne Michaels, who was a feminist, really. He really encouraged the women as much as the men mm, to create that's stuff. Right. Right. And uh, we didn't have – we only had one female writer, whereas Saturday Night Live had uh, Rosie Schuster mm-hmm. and Ann Bates and other really strong female writers. And Gilda wrote with Alan Zwei Bell, so, of course, her stuff got on pretty quickly. He was on staff. Mm-hmm. Um, so our show, I would think, was – just as stressful or more so. In fact, um, Al Franken and Harry Shearer came to visit us mm. while we were doing Fridays, and we had a long confab about how stressful the circumstances are. And in their case, every week they would stage one extra sketch, and depending how it did at the dress rehearsal, they would cut one. And so writers who and actors who had worked on that sketch all week were very invested in it and were very brokenhearted when their, their sketch didn't p- get picked. Of course, they'd have to go on with the show and do the other sketches with equal commitment, even if theirs didn't get on. In our show, we would put things into rehearsal. I had a lot of things that were put into rehearsal that didn't make it till the last few days. You know, they cut them early in the week before the costumes were made, before the sets were built, before you got really committed to it. So it was. uh, We were both on different. We were both on similar planets, but operating them very differently. Mm. Nice. Yeah, exactly. And now writing a, a memoir, I mean, is that did you keep a journal like to be able to go back and like into the vault and and it's in the vault <laughs> <laughs> and get it and get it out. Mm, actually, um I had been performing some of these stories at Comedy Central and different venues mm-hmm. not knowing what they were. I thought they were maybe a stand-up act or a one-woman show or a play. And then a literary agent came to see me at uh, one of my performances here in L.A., or was it Joshua Tree? I did a, I was commissioned oh. by the Joshua Tree Comedy Festival to do a one-woman oh, yeah. one show. And I think she saw me there, and she came up to me, and she said, this is a book. It's too literary to be um, you know, a stand-up actor, a one-woman show. So she was right, and she took me on. And um, over a year, I gathered these stories into a readable format, also a, a performable format. I do the Audible mm. book. I, 
voice it myself. Yeah. And um, but they were re- already cultivated, you know, in my imagination. I knew what the ups and downs, what the beginning, the middle, and the end, and the culmination, and the message or the learning curve of that story would be. So I have these um, 35 disparate stories that take place over 50 years of my mm-hmm. gestation from being more of a performer than I was a person, learning how to become a person and learn to love and how to have a relationship very late in life. I didn't get married till I was 65, just a few years ago, for the first time, because I hadn't developed as a human being sufficiently, really, to have a committed relationship. Mm, Isn't well, it nice see, they, finally they, to develop in your yes, life? It, I'm, it, just, it, I'm doing the same thing, Andrea. Same Melanie. thing. Me, Melanie, Melanie, I'm so sorry. Please excuse me. That's but, all right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's almost like, you know, what you were telling all of us during your spiel, that that's what I did. Mm-hmm. Same thing, but oh, as a man. Oh, you got married late? Yes. Oh, nice. And divorced. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half years later, I wanted to wait to make sure it was oh. wonderful because I had a sister and two brothers, and... They all were in their third or fourth marriage. Wow. And I wanted to wait to make sure it was right. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I Mm -hmm. didn't have that kind of discernment, Steve, until I was mature, really mature. Mm -hmm. Also, I could see the world more clearly, which I talk about in my memoir, when I wasn't in the public eye. You know, when I was Mm -hmm. a celebrity and everybody was looking at me, it was harder for me to see the world in its proper, you know, proportion. Mm -hmm. Because I was getting yeah. too much attention, so much attention. Not that I, I regret being famous. It was really fun. Such perks. Mm-hmm. It's like having rich parents, which I didn't have. Um, <laughs> you're favored. You get the best tables. You get free clothes. I mean, it was really, how, who can complain? And I got offered better work, you know, because I was known. Right. Um, but at the same time, I, I didn't have a healthy personal life because mm. I was on the go constantly. I was... Being right. required, the men would feel de emasculated by my career success. It was, it was difficult. But isn't that too bad? It yeah, only shows but, their insecurity. I guess I chose the wrong men, Steve. What could I say? Well, I chose the wrong women. Oh. <laughs> it's not too late, Steve. <laughs> Where were you when I was in L.A.? <laughs> right here. Right here. In 1973 but, and 81. No, I was in New York in 73, but I came out here in 1978, I think. So I was here. That sounds like a play. Oh, that was a neat year of my life. That's what I did. Fiddler on the Roof with Theodore Bikel and Dolores Wilson. I played Mossel, the tailor. Wonderful. Great part. Yeah. Mm. So cool. And when you were talking about uh, Andy Kaufman, I knew Mary Lou Hanner from our little gym in Hollywood. Oh, Mary Lou, And yes. through her, I got to meet him, and mm-hmm. then one of my friends knew Tony Danza. Oh, and I met lovely him guy. At a mm-hmm. par- yeah, is, wasn't he sweet? Lovely Or guy. he is sweet. Yeah. A really professional actor and singer and performer, very respectful yes. of his fellow workers. I really like working. very yeah. cute. Don't Very cute. cute. Still. He's, he's, he's my Still. boss. But, but I think this is something that's also really uh, great about your memoir is, um, I know Nancy, she, she wants to connect with you on, on your upbringing because it's kind of similar to hers too. And for me, it's also, um, as a woman, like I decided, like, that's it. I'm like, I'm done. When I turned 30, I, I, I you know, sewed things closed. <laughs> that's it. What We're closed? Done. What closed? <laughs> No, wait, what? No, I just said, that's it, I'm closed. Put a lock and the key on it, and that is it. So, like, I'm just like, I stopped. No, 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 no. I always said, if there's the right one, yeah, like, you you will feel that, you know, and you do know. And I've had my moments of, ooh, ooh, check that out. Come on, baby. But um, I chose... Our lifestyle, which is something I is very, very dear to who we, what we are, and what we do, and you know that's really me more than anything. And yeah. chose not to have children at a very, very young age, and I chose all these things. And sometimes I have, you know, a little bit of a 
like, why the hell did I do that? And a little episode, and Nancy goes, have a glass of wine. No, let's talk it out, and you'll go to a park or whatever. <laughs> and no, talk it out, or, you know, she'll say, you, you don't need to use that language in public. Um, and then <laughs> then we move on. And it, it, it's really, but at the end of the day, I, I always said that for me, there's, you know, I'll, I'll meet you later in, in, in the golden times. Like, that is mm-hmm. what I've always said. But I only want it for five years because I don't want to be a nurse with a purse. I ain't got no purse. <laughs> oh, I hear you. But it could be you who is nursed. It could be you who is nursed. So you have to keep that in mind. Do. That's absolutely right. You never right. know. But, but it's just you never know. the thing. We, and I think it's okay. And I think a lot of women my age have chosen that path. And it's not necessarily bad. But it is about you start to learn, oh, when you hit your 40s, mid-40s, 50s, now you're starting to go, okay, is this the right choice? Where are you ready? And you, you, I think you're both you and Steve are right about getting to a point of knowing who you are, what you want. And it, I only think it happens in your midlife that you start mm-hmm. to get it. You know, mm-hmm. so I appreciate that. Actually, also, you, I saw, think... you saw some career issues. You know, you may have more money in the bank. You're not as beholden to somebody right. who has a few bucks. Uh, in right. my case, you know, I had menopause. I got Medicare. Then I got married. So <laughs> it was very, very ass backwards, you know, a very different way of doing a life. But what's great is we have disposable income so we can travel when the world opens up again. We've taken an international trip twice every year. Because we have the money, you know, mm. and he's very settled in here. His career, he's a PhD psychotherapist who's able to work from our guest house now during the pandemic. So um, it really, we really lucked out. We feel so lucky. We're so in love. I thought being, you know, clo- claustrophobic in in COVID would be horrible for us, but we are lo- more in love than ever. It's just when you choose properly, you get really lucky, and that's how mm. I feel. Yeah, you do. I yeah. chose properly. I have a new friend named Mary, who oh. Lisa and Nancy know about, and I agree. I yeah. agree. Mm. You have to. Got to be a best yeah. friendship. And the other thing is, our, right. in in all honesty, since we can speak honestly here, as your mm-hmm. hormones begin to dissipate a little bit, <laughs> um, you can see God. more clearly. You can see out your heart more clearly. Yes. That's, that's what not I what Nancy's saying about me right now, because I'm in my <laughs> no? mid-40s. That's not she's saying. You're, you're heading on that track. So, like, when yeah. you, you get into that mode, you, right, Nancy? You're always like, you, I think you're, I talking, think about, I, you're you know, talking about eggs to me lately. Eggs? <laughs> Nancy does. Oh, they're going to freeze your eggs? <sighs> Jeez, no, ladies. no, 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 no. <laughs> Nancy, Nancy's just always saying you're getting to that point. But, but I do want to touch on Nancy. But you were reading in, uh, you know, in Melanie's book, uh, you were just you were talking about the same in everyone. It's called Odd Woman Out. Um, yes. Her memoir, Nancy. You were talking about that similarity of parenting. Yeah. Well, I think, I think what I'm what I'm thinking now is. It's about realizing that you actually do have a choice because the way you were brought up, the way I was brought up uh, with the headstrong male figure and the subservient wife Mm. being your mother. That's how I was brought up also. Mm. Do you feel like you actually don't have a choice in anything? And Mm. the biggest awakening is when somebody comes along and says, by the way, you actually do have a choice. And mm-hmm. you're like, what? I do have a choice. But it's not going to be easy in some aspects. But until you realize you actually always have a choice. You may not yeah. like the choices, mm. but you don't I mean, there's forward. regret. There's regret either way. I have friends yeah, that regret having kids. I have friends yeah. that regret, you know, not having kids. And, um, you know, I sort of had to, in one of those chapters, I discussed the choice of being a mother and um, I knew at a certain point I didn't have the courage for it. I just wouldn't have the courage. At that point in my life, I wasn't strong enough yet. But in recent years, feeling as adored as I do, I do have the courage to be a mother. And my God darn stepkids uh, are not having them. So fortunately for me, I have a mentee who I've been working with since she's 11 years old. Now she's 28. And she just had her first child, and she asked me to be the grandmother to her daughter. So oh. now I finally have a kid in my lap, and I'm just Wonderful. ready. I'm ready oh. for that. I'm ready to be the third lap. That is source. so sweet. That's and that's awesome. Yeah. 
that, that is. is important because I someday, love it. someday yes. the child will need your your wisdom and your help and your support because yes. you really can't always rely on parents for that. Some of right. us are lucky, some of us are not, but it always mm-hmm. takes more of a village. Different yeah, events. and my my uh, right. my mentee Angelica has Spanish speaking parents. She was illegal. Um, she didn't have a shot at getting into college without help, and I was oh. able to help her with the help of this woman's organization called Most M O S T E, and they put uh, child free <laughs> career women in tandem with at risk inner city girls, and just create these relationships. And ours just. Uh, once she got into college and graduated with a degree in social work, very proud of her, and she had DACA and was able to get a car and drive. Oh. Um, I stuck with her because she's a wonderful person. She's just, and when I was single, her family would make me dinner. They'd always, you know, make try to make me Jewish food. I'm sort of a lapsed Jewish, Jewess, uh, because her father. Um, worked in a Jewish deli, a kosher deli. So they would make me brisket, and they would make me home and tosh, and always with a little Mexican spice. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> they they became like the family I didn't have here on the West Coast, and there's oh. just so much love in that family and so much grace and gratitude. And So anyway, I'm very happy to have stayed in touch with Angelica. I love her husband, and I love this baby. Just love her. I've only held her a few times so far, but I'm in love. Oh, this is awesome. Aww. You see, I just I think that you you're you're creating this balance. I think your your book, yeah. you know, Odd Woman Out is about finding balance. And balance we um are ambassadors with for Bobby DePorter. She is a, an education expert extraordinaire and she created what's called the Eight Keys of Excellence. It's a character education or character development plan for kids and we're all working Ooh. together to get 50 million kids around the world to live these eight keys of excellence. The first one is integrity. It uh, goes mm. to uh, learning about failure leads to success. Um, you know, in, in learning how to take ownership of your actions, whether they're good or bad, uh, making, you know, having commitment. And the last one is balance. And it's about not that, oh, I have to do yoga for this, get off the computer for that. It's about living your best life. It's about when everything comes together and you're in flow, you're in tandem. Um, hey, how about that? That's the uh, John Close's album <laughs> album <laughs> name. But it is when you're in and everything's running together, when it all just kind of the puzzles fit together and you get to that point. Mm. And I think that's the you live these lives. And when you do fail, you low, oh, that's getting me forward to that another puzzle piece getting in there. So I think that's yeah. what's really um, exciting about what you're writing and are you going to write more? Because I know you've written on the comedy side and, and, and everyone, Rugrats, you know, I'm going to have yeah. a little bit of that. I, man, I can't believe your voice going how you do that. <laughs> you do oh, the right- we, we voice people like Steve. We have a lot of different lives inside our lives. It's really fun yeah, we and do. interesting <laughs> to be actors. And every character I've ever played is still in me. Every character in me developed a new aspect of me, you know, and um, mm. those aspects don't Isn't go that away. Isn't true? Yeah, it I enlarges agree. you as a I person, agree. right? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Really does. Definitely. Even me as Carol Channing. She oh, here we go. You were wonderful. And whoever would have thought. Mm. Oh, gosh. Oh, that must have been wonderful. Did you do Dolly? Hello, Dolly. Actually, I did Hello, Dolly with Janice Page. Do you remember oh. Janice Page? Uh, sure. Yeah, what did I, you was play? Cornelius Hack- I was Cornelius Hack. Oh, weren't you too young? Um, actually, I was 19, but I got the part. I auditioned. Gee, what a three auditions, and I got it. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah what thank a, what you. What a triumph. Yeah. He does a good character. That was Channing. my opening. Wow. My equity card. <gasps> wow. Wow. Yeah. Was that here in L.A.? or? No, actually, it was here in San Jose, California. Oh, San Jose. Believe it or not. Hmm. Yes, no, I do. I do believe that's it. when the San Jose Civic Light Opera decided to bring in Equity players. Good. So you were an and that was star. one of their first shows. The first show I did um, at the big theater was South Pacific with Enzo Stuarti. Now we're dating Enzo. ourselves. Oh. The Ragu Man, but he played, you know, the lead in that, mm-hmm. and that was my start. As playing mm. the professor mm. in South 
specific. So you're a character. A very actor. minor role, but mm-hmm. hey, I was happy with it. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's so much fun to be a part of something like that. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, Melanie, the one thing we talk about with Steve all the time is the importance of character roles versus, you know, you watch these big budget productions, right? And sometimes the characters lost versus the the technical stuff, the geek stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, with you, I think you're in that one of those classic character actors that you can Yes, dig and into. when I was an ingenue, I was, um, you know, I, that was a character too because I never felt really like an ingenue. Um, but I could affect it, <laughs> you know. I could play innocent and, and naive and uh, silly. Um, and uh, But I always played an ingenue like a character, mm-hmm. not as if it was completely me. I had a little schism there between the two. Um, of course. Yes, but I can still play the ingenue, Steve. Don't kid yourself, I still can. I mm. can vocally. hear it in your voice. Yes, <laughs> vocally. <laughs> I just use my higher voice. That's all, and I just, um, you know, that's I don't nice. know as not, I don't know as much. Hmm. Well, listen, you know, it's time. It is Champagne Sunday's time. We're going to have to pop our cork, and oh. uh, have. Well, no, we got to do a toast. This is very important. Yes. Um, it's you know you've got a new book coming out. So number one, like pour the champagne. Which I'm that. going to buy. Oh, you've got wow, we'll there's one. I can't there's wait. There's one person. Ding, ding, ding. I cannot wait. Ding, ding, ding. There goes the money, you Charlie. Betcha. Um, Get the Audible uh, book, Steve. Yeah. Get the Audible I'm book. Not... It'll be the best aspect, I think. Okay. Yeah. I trust it's... you. I, 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 sing, I sing. I do all the characters. It's fun. Oh, nice. Yes. Even oh, better. Wow. Thank you. Yes. Wow, that's different. Thank that's you very for that. Cool. I think it's that's probably the cool. same price. Yeah. And, and hey, normally you only get the audible afterwards, which I think is great that you're releasing all of it at one time because people yes, can make that choice. Becoming, Audible's becoming big business audiobooks, especially in the pandemic. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I know podcasting. But I will um, get is, the written copy also. Oh, that'd I want be great. that in my home. All right. I want I'd that be in happy my home. to autograph it if you mail it to me with a sealed, I mean, with a, a stamped and, and self addressed envelope. Well, of you course. Mail it back. You betcha. Okay. Cool. You cool, betcha. Cool. I don't expect anything free. Hey, we're performers. <laughs> I know. That's it. That's it. Now, yes. okay, so Odd Woman Out comes out February 2nd, but Champagne Sundays, this is a family tradition. Way back when, when we started the show, we would have our bottle of champagne and make garden borders out of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was out in the desert. You were talking about Joshua Tree. We started the show out there. Oh, and we lived out there. Yeah, beautiful out there. Really beautiful, gorgeous beautiful trees. Area. I love the I, people have burned those trees. I'm just so mad. I hope they grow back soon. I know they shoot them. They do them when we lived in Tucson. They shoot the trees, the saguaros. They they mm. and they're not trees, but they're you know they shoot them and people do the saguaro. Yeah, the they saguaro go out cactus. And shoot them. Yep, they go out and shoot them, and people try and steal them out of the park, and and oh. then you watch when they they come out and do, hey, let's you know put this new resort in or a new, and we're all tourism people, but responsible tourism, thank you, um, and when let's do a new development, they go in and want to take out, they they are like, oh, we've got these permits, we're going to move the cactus, but Nancy did, we we walk places where they do that, and mm-hmm. what did we see, <laughs> you know. Mm, it must be so interesting of, to be touring the country right now. You, oh, it is awesome. It is awesome. Um, but, Nancy, I want to start with you. Champagne toast, number one, right? we got to toast everyone for being here on the show today and on our show for the last 14 years. All our guests, experts, and listeners and supporters are advertisers and sponsors, too. You guys rock for keeping us going for the last 14 years of being able to do this. For sure. So I know, I know, right? That's a big one. But, Nancy, you tell everybody what that our next champagne toast is. What, what's the new one? Tell everyone. Well, my, my toast is that I would um, hope that people would always reflect and learn from their mistakes so that, we don't make the same mistakes that the last year had. <laughs> yeah. Mm, bravo. Here, here. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And you're being like kind, it. Nancy. I like it. Of course. It. I'm always <laughs> kind. <laughs> I'll you drink to that. that. I'll drink to that. I'm like, get the 
champagne out for that because I, we were supposed to announce our new show, but she's not. She's going for this, like, learn from, the, yeah, uh, failure leads to no, success. that's your job, Lisa. You get to do the, your... I'm the, the announcer. Right okay, so everybody, we travel the country, and we call Steve from rest areas all the time, <laughs> and sometimes we're sleeping in him. Sometimes it's a park. We have our wine with our Porter Vino. We've got our little backpack with wine, and... Um, we're not drunk. We're just having a good time. And we are responsible, very, very responsible with what we do. But um, we're going to start Rest Area Radio so that our tour is actually on the radio, <laughs> even though we have guests and we do all of this all the time with all different shows. But it's time for our tour, our Love Your Parks tour, to have its own dedicated show. And mm. it's going to be called Rest Area Radio because we're either in the car, pull over to pee, or sit and have a picnic in the gazebo or in a park playing with, you know, birds or whatever. Rest area could be a park. It could, and we think rest area is actually our parks now that we've done so many uh, this past year. So that is our new show. And we'll start recording it on site as we go. And you'll hear us call friends going, help. <laughs> it's so I don't know what to do. Um, or, hey, man, you wouldn't believe what this person's wearing out of their car. We think this. So a lot of it is going to be people watching because mm. <laughs> um, there's no, like, airports, rest areas, and people watching, like, fantastic. It is fantastic. Yes. It is. And, you can uh, learn so much from that. It's yes. True. And, and we always find wildlife. Um, mm-hmm. Alabama has cats at their rest areas and kittens, and they're taking care of them. I'm serious. Like, I'm not I joking about it. And uh, there's birds nesting inside the gazebos or the rest area picnic shelters. And also, it's also our way of protecting rest areas because when money gets uh, a little less in the coffers in different states, they'll start closing down rest areas. And as America mm-hmm. is right now doing more road tripping and um, things are a little wonky, that could happen. And um, that means truckers have no place to go pee-pee and neither do you. If you're traveling and right. uh, many a trucker has seen me pop a squat on the side of the road God. and I'm tired of that. I'm 45. I don't want to have to pop a squat, but I can't. <laughs> well, that's so a that's nice it. visual. Sheesh. Well, I know. Radio, radio, She's always saying, <laughs> come help me back up. Like, no, yeah, really. So the, the rest area radio is important, and some of them have pollinator gardens for uh, butterflies yeah. and, and hummingbirds. So there's a whole bunch but it's going to be funny, and Steve always are. So that's my toast, is that we get to finally do our own thing. <laughs> here, here, I'll are. drink to that, too. That sounds great. What yeah, are you toasting too. to? I know we're all just toasting away. Melanie, what are you toasting to? Well, I'm totally blustered now. I can't even <laughs> say. No, actually, I would like to toast <laughs> <laughs> letting the little things be large. I think that mm. one of the things that I have learned this year is to prefer the things that I'm getting to the things that I can't get during COVID, during the pandemic. And I have found my Isn't relationships, that amazing? Not even on the phone, you. even on Zoom, have become all the more oh. precious yes. and all the more yes. valued. And I feel love with my friends, even though I can't hug them. I have all these clogged right. hugs in my heart. But letting the little things in your life now be large enough to right. maintain you. And mm. having you slow down also... Melanie, yeah. to just enjoy the moments. Yes, and in value what you have, what you already have, you instead got of it. greedily going after more, more, oh. more, more, more. Because what we have is not so bad. Not no, so bad. that's the whole thing. Oh, I love you, Melanie. Oh, I love you I love too. Love Let's do Dolly like together. That. Yes. Do it. Do it. I want to I hear it. I could do Vandergilder now, and you can do Dolly. Absolutely. My girlfriend, Betty Buckley, just did Dolly this last year, and I went to see her. And, she's you know, wonderful. I met her one time yeah, she's wonderful. on the set of Eight is Enough because oh, I knew Grant Goody. Yeah, yeah, I knew mm-hmm. Grant Goody at the time. Oh, I had, a, I had a brief set. fling with Grant. Did you? <laughs> How cool. I did. Oh, what a poet. What a poet. Yeah, he was a good guy. Yeah, before he got married, this, uh, of course. Right. But, um, right. Yeah, <laughs> we, we were in an <laughs> yeah, improv that, workshop. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I shouldn't talk about cool. this. No, but if you could yeah, say it all you want, I don't, you know, to me, but it's funny, yeah, put that caveat out of there, but that's going to be part of the thing when writing a memoir of, like, not, like, hey, this person, you know what I mean, that's going to be rough. We battle with tell, that. I didn't kiss and tell, and if I did kiss and tell, I always changed the names. 
That's it. There it's you like, go. Except you know. with Henny Youngman. I told okay. the truth about Henny. <laughs> You'll have to read the book, Steve, to, to find out about Henny. Oh, I will. I would, no, like I said, I'm going to get the audio and the written version. Yeah, he Wonderful. likes his written book, too. Promise Absolutely. You. Steve, I can what get are you your talking to? through Lisa and Nancy. So. All right. Steve, what, what are you toasting to? All of the above. All of your toasts. Wow. I toast well, those. It's awesome. I can't beat that. It's totally well, great. Geez. Yes. And well, I've got to say, my first most wonderful person to meet this year is Melanie. And I'm oh, grateful oh, for that. Yeah. For 2021. What yeah, a bounce. Yeah, yeah. What a bounce. Yeah. She brought back some energy. I have oh. MS. I have MS. I'm so touched. And two Thank blown you. out knees that need to be replaced, but because of the pandemic, I can't mm. do it. Right. So, but this made my day. Thank oh, you. There you go. Thank there you. Go. I'm glad. And I'm thank glad. you, Lisa and Nancy, for our 10 years of cooperation. For your show years? and happy 14th anniversary. Thank Love you. Love you both. Happy 14th. What an achievement. That's terrific. Yes. That kind of continuity and commitment that is rare in podcasts. Absolutely. Gets, we were at the beginning, and it's kind of crazy. Like when you think, you know, I'm like, you know, my blonde hair is going gray, um, but one day oh. that will get fixed, and who cares? But it is. It's exciting, and I think podcasting is getting. It's getting. I mean, there's a, an entire magazine dedicated to it now. It is getting bigger and bigger, and it's so cool to see. And I think it's something, you know, you know, I'd love to see you do one and and have one, Melanie, because I think what you're doing is it would be cool. I mean. No. I think more comedians are doing it and yes. getting out there and saying what they need to say. And I think the world needs comedy more than anything. We need yes. entertainment. Yes. And and comedy gets us to be aware of things, music, comedy, writing, all of it. Enter- the world of entertainment is the portal to education, I believe, because it's the best but, medium of storytelling. Mm, Go ahead, Nancy. Exactly, Nancy. I think Nancy. It, it goes beyond yeah. that. It's almost yes. bringing back the art of listening. And I yeah. think that's where the world goes wrong. Um, we got so visual, we forget to listen. Mm, right. And so once you've mastered the art of listening, then you can actually master the art of understanding. So, mm. so yeah. this is what I think about podcasting. At first I was like, no, nah, I want to do video. I want this, I want that. But I think it really is about the art of listening. I mean, of course, the people doing the podcasting have to bring something to the table, which is also cool because it mm-hmm, pushes you in a new direction. But the yeah. art of listening. Mm. Yes, it's very important. important. Yeah. And that's one of the things I teach on Zoom right now is uh, to listen viscerally. Don't mm-hmm. just look at the picture. You know, yeah. it can be very confusing yeah. because you have these pictures in front of you. But really listen to the quality of the voice because the voice is an extreme close-up. Mm-hmm. Close up. You you can you obfuscate. Bet. You can animate your personality visually, but with the right. voice, you can tell somebody's being truthful or baloney. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. You can also Absolutely. look in the eyes. Yeah. When, when you have, yes, you have video, to look up yeah. at the lens. You can never look them in the eyes unless they put a, a lens in the middle of the screen finally, so we can really <laughs> look more directly at each yeah. other. That would help. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, I, right was at, I was at a good. film working <laughs> workshop. Um, in Studio City, mm-hmm. and when the first day we had to introduce ourselves, talk something, and also read from a script, but not being able to really read from the script, looking down, talking into the camera, and I got the most visual eyes that mm-hmm. sent out the message. Yeah, because so you made warm you eye contact with a cold lens, right? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that's but I wild. believed what I was saying. Mm. Yes. That's wild. That's what that's it was. Wild. Wow. Right. Melanie, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a true pleasure, and we know you're going to have the ultimate success with Odd Woman Out, Exposure in Essays and Stories. I love the title. I love it. Oh, and I love I'm the cover. The whole thing is awesome. I can't wait to finish it. You made me laugh. You made me feel all kinds of things, and that's, to me, important. Like, you... You are a brilliant writer. I love it. I love it. So everyone, oh. again, 
February 2nd. Go get it. Uh, go get it now. You can pre-order. It's MelanieCharthoff.com. And go to her YouTube channel. She's on Facebook and all of that good stuff. Um, and connect with her because she's a hoot. Uh, she does teach you things. She's got chicken soup for your soul as well and all of that. So go check it out. Thank you so much, Melanie, and have a wonderful Thank year. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Nancy. It was great to vo- vo- vocally meet you. It was good yeah, to meet you, too. Absolutely. And Steve, And great touch. to meet you, Melanie. Okay. You bet. Okay. You Take bet. good care. You gave me goosebumps today, and that's oh. cool. God. That's, cool. that's, that's, well, that's good. Wow. You know what's yeah. Thank you so much. Broke, it's broken little you bell. Bet. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, well, my yeah, second toe on the left foot. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Stay well. Have a good